Good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, it's an honor to be with you, and uh, I'm humbled here uh, sharing with you some of the views about uh, 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 the focused health system toward patients and patient care, you know. Uh, what I uh, felt, I mean, two notes I have written uh, from the previous sessions, which very much relevant <coughs> to what I'm going to say over the next 18 minutes. One is that our education and training, undergraduate education and postgraduate training, is really need, doesn't take into account, or both don't take into account, uh, to me it's one because it's continuum, don't take into account uh, the cost of healthcare and therefore how to use the resources. This is something we are puzzling with it in medical education actually at undergraduate level and gradually we are exposing our student uh, uh, to the element of cost and what does it mean when you do specific investigation which may not be needed. I'll share that some of you with some of this with you. The second thing is uh, we are not only focusing on the welfare of patients, those the 10% of society at given time, at any given time, unfortunate to have certain illnesses, uh, acute, uh, and those actually about 40% of the population with long-term condition, i.e. chronic diseases. Uh, but also we are, because of our behavior, exposing large number of healthy people to a risk which they're not supposed to expose to. And this is the serious aspect of medical practice today, which I would like to share with you. And I'll skip many of these slides because of the time and things. I mean, all knows that strong health system is very important. The American discovered that after 200 years, you know, uh, 200 years tried to develop a health system and they failed miserably because of the, of the market forces. But I think Obama's uh, reforms and Obama's health care law is, is now focusing the attention of United States toward the health system. For the first time ever, we can say that United States have a system. Any health systems having these six build blocks, these are not mine, these are actually the WHO six build building block. You can read it in their uh, uh, World Health Report 2000, uh, uh, the details are there. Actually, Imperial College now they managed to break it down into 12, and WHO a little bit happy with it, not fully, but uh, part of these, if you look at the uh, uh, enablers and indeed the outcome or the goal of the, any health system is basically to improve the health of the population. It's not only to treat illnesses, but to improve the health of the total health of the population that is the aim which is really very important i want you to remember that because i will link to it but the second aim is to respond to the need of the population and this is responsiveness which is really very much part of the uh, agenda which we were talking about personal center or person center medicine is very much linked to that responsiveness and the third issue is, is the the uh, social and financial risk of protection that a good health system you know i should receive the care free at the time of delivery you know that's a good health system you know any health system at which i have to pay then the claim or whatever later on etc creating anxiety you need to remember that for example i will mention a few countries here in egypt 40% of the diabetic patient, they don't seek care because they know they have diabetes, they diagnose with diabetes, you know, Paolo remember this discussion before, you know, but they don't seek care because they don't have money, money to pay for it. You know, in other countries, it's that, that, that more than, than this. But the, the fourth outcome, which is the focus of my talk, is the inefficiencies of the health systems. This efficiencies range from 10-15% in the British NHS highly controlled health system in the world, you know, to something like 70%, 80% in some of the healthcare system or health system in uh, low and middle income countries. 
And if we look at the challenges, and we, I discussed some of it, facing health systems today in different parts of the world, you, you are familiar with all of these, you know, uh, increases of certain disease, re-emerging other diseases, the issues of human right, the issues of cost, and the issues of leadership, in particular weak leadership, which I will stress on it later on, you know. But the aging population is taking a huge amount of our resources. Yesterday, a uh, colleague shared with us that, that uh, over the age of 65, consume about 60% of the entire resources of any health system. And that, with the increasing life expectancy, it will be more and more. As a society, everywhere in the world, in any given geographical area, we must face this fact. You know? We should celebrate it. We shouldn't feel negative about it. And, and what my worry is, is some people feel negative about it. We should spend more because people are living longer. You know? And if that maintain their health, maintain their life, you know, uh, giving them good quality of life, let us celebrate that. Okay? There are many sources of the inefficiencies which we have in our health systems around the world. And I'm reflecting on my health system and the system which I'm familiar with it. I have great honor and privilege over my years working in the health service and academic world in the United Kingdom that I have to visit and review over 55 health systems around the world. And I involved in development of this health system. I'm very proud of that. It's a great privilege and honor, to be honest with you. But I've seen that many health systems are indulging over diagnosis. You know? Over diagnosis lead to over treatment. And, and this is one of the riskiest things of modern medicine today. It's, it's really all these discoveries we have is something we welcome. The new te technology. Contrary to a large number of people believe that it costs the health service more. In reality, it does, you know, increase the total cost. But actually, it's lower, has two advantages. Lower the unit cost, but most importantly, giving chance to a large number of people in the past we couldn't reach or treat, you know. That's the reason of the increase in the total cost. Again, this is something which we should celebrate rather than treated negatively. And, and this is actually, this article in the BMJ opened our eyes, you know, in terms of, for the first time, we have been told, you are exposing the healthy population to harm. That really changed our thinking, you know. And, and, and somebody now telling us uh, whether those people against evidence, this is, this is the beauty of evidence, you know. Some people telling us we are, you know, killers. We are not caring as we believe. We are harming people. And, and this article, and there are subsequent articles from the BMJ showing how much damage we do to the population which we're supposed to serve, especially the healthy, which we're supposed to maintain and improve their health. Remember the first outcome of the, uh, the first goal of the any health system is to improve the health of the population. This is goes exactly in the opposite di direction. And you see that the drivers for overdiagnosis are well known. You know, the technological change, you know, we are most probably misusing it. The commercial and the professional uh, vested interest, we have lobbies, etc. I don't want to go to it because we have time, don't have time. Uh, the conflicted evidence sometimes used producing uh, uh, overexpanded disease definition. And this is happening all the time. And that's why I said to Paolo, may, you may remember in his uh, beautiful presentation, that his guideline is out of date. The most recent guideline he used was for the year 2008. While in 2012, we have guideline in terms of diagnosis of diabetes is much higher threshold than he illustrated. And, and this is really the biggest problem we face in medicine, you know. There are so much redefinition of condition without consensus, without evidence, you know. And that is a huge risk to our population. And the issues of legal incentives, of course, lawyers is make it difficult for us not to use uh, uh, equipment which we have. 
the health system incentive itself, you know, whether whether they, you, you have regulation or not, I, 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 this is this is a huge uh, area which we could uh, uh, discuss it if you wish, but certainly the cultural belief that more uh, is better, you know, faith in what we are doing have a great impact on what we are doing. All right, let me give you ex some example from some of the studies around the world. And this is only uh, a very, very uh, uh, snapshot of a uh, long journey uh, uh, between health systems around the world and how they do it. Uh, they believe, the Canadian, that about 30% of the people diagnosed with asthma, they don't have asthma at all. And mind you, Canada is a very cold country. Uh, anyone going to Alberta in the winter will face uh, minus 30, minus 35 degrees centigrade, you know? And, and this is really very serious. It's extremely serious. And I, I, I know from the way I talk to patients, you know, all my life, that labeling someone with a disease, uh, a disease he or she doesn't have, it's really a very serious problem. And this is not an acute condition that you provide a penicillin or an injection and it will be sorted out. This is a diagnosis with a stay with the patient forever, you know. Of course, asthma change. I mean, asthma is like different than any other conditions, you know. It could be asthma today, it could be nothing tomorrow. You know, with age, it would progress, it decreases, etc. You know, we know children progress from asthma to no asthma, you know. But, but the problem is, you know, that even those who diagnosed with asthma, 66% of them need no medication, just simple advice. Yet they are receiving medication at a huge cost, you know. And I, and I will go on and on, you know, and uh, as you know, this attention deficit uh, uh, hyperactive uh, uh, disorder, which is well known, and the way it is described uh, around the world, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't take it that seriously as a pediatrician. But look at breast cancer. This is extremely serious, you know? We are living in the era of, as I said yesterday, Angelina Jones, you know? It's a fashion, it's good to remove your breasts, you know? And that is extremely serious. 30%, this is what, what are saying, one third, one third of the women screened, diagnosed with cancer, they don't have. This is very serious, and we know that. And when we reviewed some of the services, even in the United Kingdom, we found pathologists over-diagnosing, actually, some of the uh, 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 histopathology. Hence, legally now, we don't allow a single report by a single pathologist. It's not allowed, you know? Every single histopathology must be seen and signed by two pathologists. You know, to minimize error, to minimize overconfidence. The problem with repetitive work. Medicine is a very boring <laughs> uh, profession for some of us, you know, being a dentist, being a <laughs> not, not general practitioners. I, will, I don't, don't say that for GPs. But certainly for people in pathology, seeing a specimen after a specimen after a specimen, minor error tend to be accumulated over the years, you know. And that deviation from normality, a small one could be reflected as a high percentage on the population. But this is, this is really quite serious, you know, in terms of looking, looking at the slide and the real, the actual, the, the pink one, and the real, the, 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 the diagnosed one is the other one. There's a huge gap between the real and the actual. And uh, uh, we are engaging in a huge phenomenon, Barbara Starfield, the late Barbara Starfield described it, pseudo diseases, you know, that, that we are labeling people with diseases which, which actually they don't have. You know, the percentage is extremely high. As I said, I can go on and on. I'm just mentioning two or three things for you just to look at it, you know. Uh, 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 some of these, even the prostatic cancer. And I, we know the story about the P, uh, PSA. 
I mean, for somebody to rush to surgery because his PSA is eight or seven, you know, while actually the labs say it should be under four, is entirely meaningless today, you know. And we know it is not that specific as a lot of people believed. We know the debate about screening for prostatic cancer and why it's rejected simply because PSA is not that reliable, you know. But here, overdiagnosis is over 60 percentage. And again, when you say to a person you got cancer, the impact of that on the person, and indeed the family, you know, is so, so severe, you know. It's really devastating impact on the family. If we believe in person-centered medicine, this is person-centered medicine, you know, to protect the healthy from overdiagnosis and overintervention. And again, high blood pressure. As you know, the various studies by London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, even when I was a student, actually, I remember these, you know, 12 cardiologists giving them the uh, 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 same patient to measure their, their blood pressure. They gave you different results, you know. <laughs> it's well documented, well, well, well uh, known, you know, and, and we have many examples of that. And what is normal? I don't know anything in medicine which is called normal. I don't know what is normal. I never use normal in my life. Yes, I use optimal. But my optimal could be different for me than Andrew or Stephen, you know. Each one has his, his or her own optimal. Yet we never focus on the patient to say this is your optimal. But we're talking about normality and we use as if it's God given when a human being is born, 120 over 80 is the normal things. Osteoporosis, again, a uh, uh, large number of women and categories, etc. We use a lot of diagnosis which we don't know the impact of it on human being now, you know. And that's why we need to be very careful over the use of these. This is not my invention or not my, my article. This is in the BMJ saying that we don't know the risk of CT scan, you know. Maybe it is like X-ray when it was invented, was very simple method, but gradually we discovered X-ray is dangerous. We shouldn't, we shouldn't overuse it. We never associated at that time the link between cancer and X-ray, you know, something which we discovered. Anyway, we're having enough X-ray nowadays in airports, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> we can't get it. You see, the third element is really poor prescribing. And let me focus on one or two things about, you know. Many studies showing about 70% of the prescription is not needed. I mean, it's really serious, the joke that when, when a patient needed B12, you know, and went to the pharmacy and the pharmacist said, sorry, we don't have B12, we'll give you two B6, you know. <laughs> It, it, it's a real one, you know, but it is, it's quite serious. If I give you the analysis, and I, uh, working in the NHS and as a director in, 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 in one of the areas in South London, I have the privilege to analyze the entire prescribing of my GPs, you know, because we analyze that by diagnosis, by, by, by uh, uh, categories of uh, uh, conditions, etc. And uh, we know about the errors in the prescribing, etc. But the most serious one is this, the misuse of antibiotic. And this is again not me, this is our chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davis. You know, before the G8 meeting a few months ago, she made this statement that actually misuse of antibiotic is equated to terrorism, you know. And she said in a few years time, estimated in 10, 15 years time, we will not have antibiotic, you know, to treat infections because most of the infection will be resistant to current antibiotics. And there are very, very, very few clinical trials, those who don't believe in clinical trials, very few clinical trials, the industry is not investing enough in a new generation of antibiotic. Antibiotic resistance, as big a risk as terrorism, medical chief said, you know. And, and this is something 
didn't come out of the blue. This is something as the result of our poor practices. You know, we are harming the people. We are deprived them from good weapons which they may need in the future, but it will not be available. And that is really, really very serious. You know, my time will be over soon. Uh, Andrew is uh, start nodding. Do I have little, little bit? You know, and you know the uh, uh, patient control. Uh, large proportion of our patient demand services which are not needed. This is the misinformation I went into debate with intellectual debate with Andrew about it earlier, you know. Uh, a lot of patient demanding second opinion. And we know the catchphrase is that three psychiatrists will give you five, five different opinions, you know. And this is quite risky, actually. Uh, in one practice where I used to see patients, you know, almost 20% of our patients asking for a second opinion. When, when we refer them to hospital and the hospital said, you don't have any problem, go home. You know, just forget about it. They are not satisfied, you know. And if you keep digging, you will find something. You like it or not, that's the nature of medicine, you know, because it's not linear science, as I said, you know. And unnecessarily admission, we know a very large number of people admitted to services, which really they shouldn't be. Of course, you are familiar with the bed blockage, you know. That is a serious thing now, which is exist in many health systems around the world, incompetent doctors. There is unfortunately a belief, which is wrong belief, that the minute a medical student leaving the medical school, he's a competent doctor. That is wrong. All the studies showing that none, there is no single medical school in the world graduating a doctor who are actually able to practice independently. Practice independently. They should practice under supervision until they finish their training. And that training should be hand glove. From the day you finish medical school, they should go on to entering into higher medical training. You know? And that continuum of training, as you see it here, this is in the United Kingdom. Medical school don't give skills. Medical schools, as you see it here, you know, is about learning in the early years. It's about knowledge, little bit of attitude, but the skills come during the years of training, post, post graduate training, not education. Be, be careful, the term education is about taught things, you know. So that's very important element we need to remember. The issues is really close to my heart is the poor weak leadership in health services at all level, you know. And, and we experience around the world, we can give you horror stories in the same way colleagues give beautiful stories about achievement. We can give you, uh, I don't uh, say beautiful horror stories, but horrific stories about uh, 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 lost uh, 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 people, lost resources, lost, you know, focus, lost confidence, you know, simply because of the weak leadership. And the most recent one is Mid Mid Staffordshire, and simply because of the weak nursing leadership at a &E department, you know, and weak leadership at board level that they didn't notice what's going on. There is dislocation between the top and the delivery, you know? And, and Mid Staffordshire is now don't exist as a hospital, as a trust, it was, you know, dissolved. Uh, but we lost 1,500 lives. 1,500 families affected by our misbehavior. It is misbehavior at a high level. Lack of leadership to me is as critical as poor quality in, in, in service delivery. That's the, that's the inquiry, by the way. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't recommend that you should read it, but uh, I have to read it for a variety of reasons. But it, it's uh, really overwhelming, um, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish. And, and uh, uh, incompetent staff, we talk about uh, uh, weak leadership, 
uh, it's important to talk about effective organization. And that term, I don't use it loosely. Governance is so important. I, uh, I'm grateful that Sir Jonathan talking about this society, the first word he said, I need to set up the governance for this organization. And this is show you, uh, you are in the hand of an experienced man in management. And that, that by, speaks volume, you know. That element of governance, whether you are running a medical school or you are running a mosque or you are running a church or whatever, it's absolutely essential, but that needs to be projected as a public accountability. And this is a very complex phenomenon. And, and this is, again, to show you, uh, uh, this is one of the research which has received a lot of publicity recently, you know, from Imperial. I'm just sharing with you in, in random way some of the things about inefficiencies. You know, it is very unsafe to have an operation at the end, at the weekend, for example. You know, it's simply because staff availability is low. You know, again, that, that, that is a governance issue. You know, hospital 24 hours, it should operate 24 hours. Last but not least is the issues of regulation. Weak regulation will have impact on health system. I don't have to, time to go through it. But all these creating opportunity cost, cost which we don't have. But also the commercial sector here, which is show you the same procedure, let me take spin. The same procedure, hip replacement costing is actually a fraction to the same procedure carried out in the United States. You know, you've seen 7,000 in, in Spain, 40,000 in the United States. Primary care for the same procedure costs much less, you know. There are a lot of ways to tackle it, you know. I leave it on the slide for you. There are the references also available here and you're welcome to uh, 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 go through it at any time. Thank you very much indeed. I present uh, a course on person-centered medicine, the first and only course in Southeast and Eastern Europe. I believe that this is very much in the topic and we'll have uh, much to share with Dr. Caballero. This course has been designed in the academic 2012-2013 uh, and uh, it has been promoted by the Faculty of Medicine, the Medical University of Plovdiv in Bulgaria, with uh, the moral and logistic support of Professor Andrew Miles. The structure of this course uh, is based on teaching uh, to students in medicine from year one to year six. It's elective course still. We have been discussing the matter of uh, the mandatory subjects and the mandatory curriculum uh, with uh, the vice rector here. Uh, obviously, in uh, southern as well as in eastern Europe, there are regulations which cannot be escaped from. In my country, those regulations are very robust. So we had no other chance but to offer it as elective course. But we offered it to all students without exception, which caused terrible administrative issues. Because, you know, the clerks in, in the education department, they tend to believe that certain elective course is designated for certain year. And I needed to admit the problem to the dean himself, so that the dean may allow all students from first to sixth year to enroll. And uh, fortunately, the dean has himself an elective discipline in sports physiology, which is opened to all six years. Therefore, he was very sympathetic. Uh, it is 60 hours course, two semesters, uh, 30 hours per semester, and is divided into two accredited modules, which I shall present shortly. Our teaching methods included lectures which we delivered with Professor Miles. He has about eight hours, I have the rest of 22 hours. Then we have interactive learning seminars delivered by the assistants, case studies and role play exercise which are prepared by the students themselves. Now uh, I uh, skip directly to module one, which is my module actually, uh, uh, originally the most uh, uh, theoretical uh, part of the course. It is philosophical and humanities aspects of person-centered approach in medicine. When actually my university announced the full professorial position, the chair that I occupy since the 1st of February, it, it was for, for 
psychiatry, medical psychology, person-centered medicine, and this extension, those three lines. The first lecture is on epistemology of medicine. Uh, we have spoken about Windelband dichotomy, about facts and values. These are two hours dedicated to subjective and objective knowledge of human suffering. Uh, the second lecture is in philosophy of mind, the psychophysical and psychosomatic problems. The third is on methodology of scientific inquiry, and it focuses on validity, reliability, specificity, and sensitivity. The fourth is on medical taxonomy, uh, then it is the fifth lecture on evidence-based and values-based medicine, uh, which introduces full foot stand principles, and uh, the sixth lecture of this module is health and disease in person-centered perspective, notion of normativity. The entire module is based exclusively on knowledge from philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, methodology of science, and uh, to a certain extent uh, from uh, the values-based uh, theory as delivered by Bill Fulford. What is the emphasis of this entire course is that uh, medicine is a humanistic enterprise which is embedded into scientific knowledge which scientific knowledge needs to be understood properly. Typically, in the end of this module, uh, it is Professor Miles who delivers a kind of sum up of uh, this entire uh, conceptual, uh, conceptual part of the course. This is typically the sixth lecture. Then it is module second, uh, which is more or less practical, it is uh, dedicated to communicative techniques and approaches in medicine and healthcare. Uh, it is uh, more extensive. The first uh, seminar is on human personality structure and organization of human personality, temperament and character, and Cloninger's psychobiological model. The second is about defense mechanisms, the so called Abwehr mechanism. The third is on personality and values as determinants of human behavior. Then it is the person in the context, the role of social, cultural, ethnic, religious, and other values into play with individual values. And the fifth is essentials of communicative techniques, content and process, transference and counter-transference in communication. What I should emphasize in this slide is the fourth le lecture and seminar, uh, which is dedicated to e the interplay between the external social values and individual values and preferences and the way they interact in decision making. Typically it is Professor Maus who interferes with this lecture uh, uh, talking about shared decision making. To be continued, the module two uh, then is uh, progressing to adaptation and anticipation uh, as mechanisms of normative behavior motivation and health behavior. This is something to say about how people decide what is normal and healthy in terms of preserving their health, positive health. The ninth is person-centered assessment of psychosomatic disorders. This is my lecture and uh, uh, as well as the last one, person-centered approach to stress management burnout syndrome. The tenth seminar includes training exercises uh, dedicated to coping with professional distress and uh, first symptoms of flame out uh, syndrome. Our course, as it has been already mentioned a couple of times, is international. And in addition to its implementation, which is original, and uh, as uh, it has been stressed, uh, that, that this is the first venture of such kind for Eastern Europe. We have been able to expand to 15 hours, with 15 hours, to the overall of 30. Much interesting, how, how did you do that? But medical psychology, is it the name of the discipline here? Medical psychology. Yes. How, ma how many hours do you have? 60. 60, so we have... We have to go after, as far as I return, <laughs> I shall demand from the Dean uh, uh, to, to expand, uh, to expand uh, psychology. But 
when I came into office, it was 15 hours of seminars, just practical seminars. Now we have 15 lectures, 15 classes, seminars, and we think seriously about expanding to 60. I assume that the Dean will agree, but this will happen in exchange for some hours from person-centered medicine, since he will see it as a tautology. And uh, also, we have been able to attune the undergraduate teaching uh, in psychiatry, in a more person-centered perspective, in fifth year of medical training. And this is the narcissistic slide to conclude that the first and the only full professorial chair for joint teaching of dimension disciplines has been granted last year and occupied in early 2014 by myself. So uh, I believe that political developments in terms of academic personnel uh, progress, progress in career terms, do provide sustainability of this effort and we plan to provide a f further basis uh, for this by, uh, by requirements uh, in terms of PhD positions, in terms of assistant professor positions, and at least one associate professorship. Thank you for your attention. I made it! Bien, en estos días hemos visto eh, algunas necesidades para que finalmente podamos mm, crear una medicina central a la persona y estas son algunas de las que esta mañana escuchaba. Pero quizá uno puede esperarse a que las cosas las arreglen desde la política, desde la gestión sanitaria u otros, o coger la pala y empezar a limpiar la puerta de casa. De forma que nuestra propuesta es que la clave de esta revolución necesaria, si todos consideramos que la medicina debe ser reinventada, es el, el factor humano. Tenemos una historia corta, apenas cuatro años, por tanto, algunas de las cosas que explicamos deben ser puestas en tela de juicio y a la espera de la confirmación en el tiempo. Somos una escuela muy joven dentro de 42 escuelas de medicina en España, por tanto, un mercado competitivo donde otras han trabajado pues, en crear una imagen de marca En nuestro caso, el trabajo fue más eh, pensar cuál debería ser nuestra misión como nueva escuela de medicina y dedicamos un tiempo largo a repensar el sistema sanitario, el cuidado sanitario. Las preguntas son, ¿hace falta un cambio en la medicina? Y en el caso de que así sea, ¿es posible este cambio en el mundo universitario? En España esto obliga a pensar de forma distinta a como hemos venido haciendo y a estar dispuestos a cambiar paradigmas. Sería fácil cambiar así. Si pudiéramos resetear a todos los médicos, el cambio sería inmediato. En pocos días lo conseguiríamos, pero no parece la vía rápida. Creemos que podemos aportar, si eh, trabajamos en la formación desde las primeras fases de la educación sanitaria, cuando todavía el, el árbol es tutorizable y se pueden corregir desviaciones. Esperamos entonces a contaminar el sistema sanitario al cabo de generaciones, cuando nuestros primeros egresados salgan al sistema sanitario. Esto nos obliga a repensar también la educación, la forma de conseguir estos nuevos objetivos en la formación de los médicos, de los futuros médicos. Parece que es tiempo de pensar y repensar todo, ¿no? En concreto, ¿qué piensan los profesores sobre esto? ¿Qué piensan los alumnos de medicina? ¿Qué piensa la profesión? ¿Hace falta este cambio? en las escuelas de medicina. Los profesores piensan que el, la formación tradicional en España, y creo que en otros países puede compartirse, es excesivamente teórica, con una práctica clínica de baja calidad, y donde los valores profesionales están ausentes. No se tratan. Algo tan sustancial para la práctica como lo que estamos comentando, no se recoge en los currículums de grado. Coinciden plenamente los estudiantes. La presidenta del Consejo Estatal de Estudiantes de Medicina de España, una representante de estudiantes, publica un artículo en la que se pregunta qué está pasando con los valores profesionales en el entrenamiento de médicos. Dice cosas como que en lugar de la empatía, la humildad intelectual, lo que se fomenta es la competición, la autosuficiencia, el orgullo, el trabajo individual, valores que quizá en el mundo de la empresa tengan sentido, pero que casan mal con la medicina. 
La profesión también está preocupada. La Organización Médica Colegial de España, la Asociación de Todos los Colegios Profesionales Médicos, hizo hace pocos años un documento sobre la urgencia de introducir los valores en la formación de la universidad. Este documento se elevó a la Unión Europea, al Standing Committee de los European Doctors, y es algo que preocupa a la profesión, y etcétera, etcétera. Recientemente, recientísimamente, anoche leía en el Academic Medicine un artículo que nos pregunta sobre repensar el significado del grado para el siglo XXI. Cuando comenzamos el diseño de la carrera en este centro, 2010, coincidió con la entrada en vigor del Plan Bolonia, un asunto delicado y muy contestado, que fue motivo de huelgas en toda Europa de estudiantes, pero que representó una oportunidad que no va a volver. 47 países se comprometieron a hacer un modelo común, formativo, y fue un momento de posible cambio. Cambio en los objetivos del aprendizaje y cambio en, los, en las formas de enseñar. Una auténtica metamorfosis universitaria. Desde la Edad Media, la universidad se había ocupado de generar y de garantizar el conocimiento en los alumnos. Se nos propone conseguir desarrollar competencias en los, en los futuros profesionales y ser capaz de demostrarlas. Frente a un modelo tradicional con una hipertrofia del conocimiento y con unas habilidades muy pobremente desarrolladas, este es mi modelo en el que yo me formé, este fue mi perfil profesional al acabar la carrera, se plantea la necesidad de hacer hincapié en toda la competencia profesional, aquello que nos permite resolver problemas de forma autónoma y con responsabilidad, algo más complejo que el conocimiento, que contiene desde luego conocimiento intensivo, pero también habilidades, actitudes adecuadas y capacidad de juicio, razonamiento, toma de decisiones. Además, en esta escuela tenemos otra clave, que es intentar cubrir todo esto por un marco de valores explícitos que el alumno entienda, comparta y practique. Y no somos en esto tibios, sino que se hacen muy explícitos desde la entrada en la escuela. Por tanto, la, la competencia clínica tiene dos caras, la necesidad de pericia clínica y la excelencia humana. Los conocimientos y las habilidades técnicas junto a las habilidades y las competencias relacionales, comunicativas y los valores profesionales. En palabras de Andrew Miles, en alguna ocasión hemos hablado sobre esto. El entrenamiento médico completo requiere actuar sobre la mente, sobre las manos y sobre el corazón, quizá, donde las actitudes o los valores aniden. Nada nuevo bajo el sol. Hace ya tiempo se comentó que un buen médico se hace por el matrimonio entre la ciencia aplicada y la, el humanismo médico. Nuestro plan estratégico en esta facultad, 2014-2018, incluye como misión eh, promover el desarrollo de la medicina centrada en la persona, su diseminación y su puesta en práctica. Y entendemos por persona no un, una maquinaria perfecta que a veces falla y que hay que reponer, sino toda una biografía. Una biografía que tiene dimensiones, ya se ha comentado tanto en estos días, física, mentales, psicológicas, eh, familia, pareja, trabajo espiritualidad. Dimensiones todas ellas que componen al ser humano integralmente entendido y todas ellas pueden ser alteradas por la enfermedad. De forma que un médico competente debería ser capaz de dar cobertura, comprensión y atención a cada una de las dimensiones que la enfermedad altere en su paciente. Esta es nuestra brújula de camino, la Person Centered Medicine. Bien, hasta aquí ideas, pero ¿cómo se hace esto? Porque la propuesta era contar aspectos prácticos del desarrollo de un grado eh, con esta orientación. ¿Cuál es la estrategia que seguimos? Bueno, por resumir, dado el escaso tiempo, intentamos solventar algunos de los déficits tradicionales de la formación médica a través del de desarrollo de lo que hemos llamado itinerarios formativos, itinerarios docentes, para aquellos objetivos que son muy importantes, que queremos cuidar particularmente, desarrollamos una intervención en el tiempo, de forma helicoidal que revisita, vuelve a visitar estos objetivos desde distintos focos, con distintos contenidos, con distintos momentos y con distintas metodologías también. Me explico. Estos cuatro contenidos armarán a un médico capaz de este cambio, un médico que tenga competencias comunicativas y relacionales, algo sorprendente, a lo que dedicamos el 50% del tiempo en la práctica clínica, no, no se recoge en las asignaturas del currículum actual. Se entiende que uno 
llega a la facultad con esto aprendido. Un entrenamiento clínico débil, que no capacita para actuar de una forma responsable. Una ausencia prácticamente total de valores profesionales, de humanidades y de ética. Se tratan como pequeñas asignaturas, a veces selectivas. Y una competencia, una incompetencia para la investigación, eso particularmente en España. ¿Qué herramientas utilizamos en estos itinerarios formativos? Aquí están algunas de ellas. Voy a dar pinceladas de cada una para que se pueda entender de una forma rápida. Tiempo habrá de intercambiar información a, a posteriori. El proceso comienza en el día de la admisión. Hoy estamos publicando las listas de los nuevos alumnos que entrarán en octubre en esta escuela. El proceso de admisión se reclamó hace tiempo que los candidatos a estudiar medicina deberían ser escogidos no solo por su rendimiento académico, sino por aquello que tienen en el corazón, por rasgos de personalidad eh, humanística que predigan un buen comportamiento en el, la futura práctica clínica. Y así lo hacemos. Usamos información del rendimiento académico a través del examen estatal, la PAU española, junto a una medición objetiva de rasgos de personalidad humanística como los que esperamos de un médico. Es una herramienta capaz de predecir comportamientos y capaz de medir 45 dimensiones de la personalidad que comparamos con un perfil ideal, preestablecido. Tenemos un concepto de cómo sería un médico ideal en, en sentido científico-técnico, en, en sentido humano, y comparamos a cada candidato, al perfil de cada candidato, con el perfil teórico ideal. La tasa de acuerdo nos determina en qué medida ese candidato nos gusta para nuestra escuela. Se le acompaña durante un año un proceso de mentoría para confirmar que no nos equivocamos, que no se equivocó y que continúa en el intento de hacerse médico, con un programa específico. Otra de las dificultades de los, de los déficits eh, fundamentales en la medicina española es la incapacidad de los médicos para comunicar adecuadamente, para recoger adecuadamente información, para proveerla, para negociar con el paciente, para ayudar a la toma de decisión, para dar una mala noticia o motivar para un cambio. Nuestro itinerario de entrenamiento en habilidades clínicas y relacionales dura toda la carrera. Comienza, tiene tres fases, una fase de sensibilización para hacer entender al alumno que llega del bachillerato la importancia que tiene cuidar los aspectos relacionales y comunicativos con el paciente y la necesidad que tiene de entrenarse en ello. Cosa que hace en el tercer y cuarto años, en un entorno seguro, sin riesgos ni molestias para pacientes, el entorno de la simulación. El quinto y sexto año se hace un acompañamiento de la experiencia clínica. El programa de inmersión clínica precoz con el que empieza este itinerario se basa en experimentos etológicos, donde parece que un animal recién nacido, eh, si la primera imagen que tiene de el adulto de su especie es de otra, puede adoptar roles y rasgos de comportamiento de la, de la especie que ambiente. Si en vez de un pato, este pollo, ve un gato, pues quizá persiga pájaros. Y es porque es un momento en el que es muy permeable al cambio. Pensamos también que el estudiante de medicina debe ser pronto troquelado con esta nueva visión de la medicina y durante el primer y segundo año les exponemos a la práctica clínica. En el primer año, en el servicio general, atención primaria y hospital, en el segundo año, B, cuidados paliativos y la enfermedad psiquiátrica, dos entornos muy particulares del enfermar humano, en general maltratados en la medicina española. Es una experiencia de observación reflexiva. Acompañan a médicos en ejercicios en cualquier contexto y en cualquier entorno asistencial y se les pide que observen y reflexionen sobre rasgos positivos o negativos del comportamiento de los clínicos en la comunicación y en el manejo de la consulta, a quienes les gustaría parecerse, a quienes evitarán parecerse cuando finalmente sean médicos. Ese trabajo está dirigido a través de un, una asignatura, a través de una guía de práctica, un cuaderno de recogida de campos y hay mucha literatura y mucha evidencia sobre los beneficios en actitudes y en valores profesionales long life, a lo largo de toda la vida del, del futuro profesional. Pasan por hospitales, pasan por centros de atención primaria, pasan por centros de cuidados paliativos donde ven a veces situaciones complejas para un estudiante de primero de medicina que aún apenas conoce la bioquímica o la genética. Y acaban en una presentación en esta misma sala ante todo su el alumnado y el el claustro de profesores, donde se reafirman en que quieren ser médicos y hacen una reflexión del aprendizaje de esta experiencia. Esto ha sido motivo 
de un premio, no es ninguna innovación en muchos países anglosajones, son programas existentes que hemos adaptado y hemos mm, hecho posible en España por de primera. Ese programa de comunicación clínica continúa en el tercer y cuarto años entrenándose en el entorno de la simulación clínica, con objetivos crecientes. En el, primer, en el tercer año, el alumno aprende tareas básicas de comunicación clínica, indispensables para el manejo de una consulta, y en el cuarto año situaciones complejas, como sea dar una mala noticia o ayudar a un paciente a motivar un cambio vital. Tenemos un primer programa universitario de pacientes estandarizados, que no solamente pueden recrear situaciones reales, sino que pueden hacer feedback directo del desempeño de los alumnos. El programa de entrenamiento clínico, para garantizar una competencia que a mí me faltó al acabar la carrera, tenía mucho conocimiento, pero una incompetencia plena para tomar decisiones, para recoger información, para hacer lo que un médico debe saber hacer, lo intentamos solventar de la siguiente forma. Este es el modelo tradicional de formación. Uno comienza por el conocimiento, va a clases teóricas y después hace una práctica clínica donde lo pone en juego y lo desarrolla. En la práctica, el, paciente, el estudiante no puede interactuar por ley eh, en gran medida con los pacientes. Apenas puede entrevistarlo, no puede informarle, no puede, por supuesto, tratarle. Es una práctica muy poco significativa. Cambiamos este modelo por un espacio intermedio de simulación donde el paciente es autónomo, el estudiante, perdón, es autónomo, puede realizar práctica real, puede tomar decisiones reales y puede entrenar la competencia integralmente. Exactamente igual que se hacen en profesiones de riesgo, como es el pilotaje de aviones. Y a esto dedicamos una buena parte de la formación de cada curso clínico. Durante un tiempo, previa a las prácticas clínicas, los estudiantes hacen clases teóricas que se siguen de simulación en, el, en la instalación que al, yo creo que muchos de vosotros o todos ayer pudisteis conocer. La simulación clínica, por tanto, tiene dos áreas para el entrenamiento clínico, la robótica y para el entrenamiento en excelencia humana, en habilidades comunicacionales y valores, la simulación con paciente estandarizado. Son entornos que ya conocéis. Es un entorno donde el profesor no actúa, más que supervisa. El trabajo del alumno es autónomo. Es aquí el día en el que puede equivocarse, donde el error es bienvenido y donde la reflexión del error genera el aprendizaje, para no repetirlo. Solamente entonces, cuando se superan los objetivos del aprendizaje en simulación, se autoriza a que el estudiante interaccione con pacientes en la práctica clínica, a la cabecera del paciente. Y esta práctica clínica se supervisa muy de cerca con una herramienta electrónica, que es un registro de las tareas clínicas que se han preestablecido el alumno. Cada alumno, en tiempo real, demuestra a la cabecera del paciente y en presencia de un tutor que es capaz de hacer aquello que se consideró imprescindible en el grado. En la imagen de arriba se ve una exploración física de un, del aparato locomotor donde un monitor está chequeando a través de un checklist si eh, fue suficientemente intensiva, exhaustiva. Otro déficit particular de la eh, formación en España es la investigación, la capacitación en investigación, e, inspirados en, un, en el Centro para la eh, Person Centered Medical Care de la Universidad de Gotemburgo, la profesora Inger Ekman, hemos organizado un itinerario formativo específico para investigación, para que todo alumno pase por una experiencia personal de investigación a lo largo de la carrera en pequeño equipo de cinco miembros. Comienza en el primer curso con contenidos teóricos imprescindibles de la biostadística o de la metodología y entre el tercero y el quinto se desarrolla en la práctica y a la cabecera del paciente la investigación. Todas ellas orientadas eh, con, hacia el centro de la persona, en el sentido de que investigamos eh, preferencias de pacientes, investigamos qué grado de información tienen los pacientes a la salida de las consultas de atención primaria, por ejemplo, en ancianos, investigamos... Eh, cuál es la experiencia del paciente que pasó por el sistema sanitario durante un ingreso hospitalario al cabo de un mes, en qué fallamos, cuáles son las, las expectativas no cubiertas, eh, a veces inesperadas y desconocidas para los clínicos, ¿no? pues son de respeto a la intimidad, o etcétera, etcétera. El, el proceso acaba en la presentación pública del trabajo fin de grado frente a un tribunal. Y por último, eh, para hacer el necesario hincapié en la formación en valores profesionales y en aspectos éticos de la profesión, eh, no vamos a perder en esto mucho tiempo porque inmediatamente después hay una sesión clínica específicamente dirigida a la figura de Edmundo Pellegrino que inspira nuestro modelo de formación en bioética que habla de ciertas virtudes éticas que
que eh, son explícitas y que el alumno debe conocer y compartir y practicar. Cuando le damos de abnegación, pues él tiene que entender que se metió en una carrera que deberá exigir más que el resto de, de carreras. El itinerario de formación en, eh, en valores y en ética dura los seis años y comienza, es piramidal, de forma que se construye desde la base con una eh, formación, con un departamento específico dedicado a esta formación humanística que comienza con conocimiento filosófico, con conocimiento antropológico, que es el ser humano, que es nuestro campo de juego, cuál es el motivo de su dignidad, si la tiene. En el tercer curso hablamos de ética general y de ontología y solo a partir del cuarto aterrizamos en la bioética. En los últimos años clínicos, en cada asignatura clínica, en la cardiología o en la traumatología, se hacen seminarios clínicos éticos que reproducen la estructura de un comité de ética asistencial donde se resuelven dilemas éticos eh, frente a los estudiantes por clínicos expertos, másteres en bioética. Aparte hay actividades de tipo experiencial o vivencial, ¿no? donde el alumno no recibe una clase, no escucha eh, un seminario, sino que participa, por ejemplo, en acciones de voluntariado, esto se hace en el verano del primer curso, eh, hay alumnos que hacen ayuda en, un, en el último leprosario que existe en Europa, que está en, en la, Alicante, en la costa eh, española. Hay un ciclo de cine y medicina donde hacemos una reflexión acompañada por clínicos de algunas películas que plantean retos eh, éticos para médicos o hacemos un seminario itinerante, un viaje que recorre lugares de memoria donde los médicos tuvieron un protagonismo particular en la historia de el, la época nazi y donde médicos en ejercicio, pues en esta foto de abajo a la derecha vemos a el comandante del campo de Auschwitz-Birkenau haciendo un acto médico que era la clasificación de un paciente como apto para la vida o eh, indigno de ella. Todas las mujeres, niños y enfermos pues eran directamente clasificados para su destrucción. Hechos como este y otros que ocurrieron antes y después de la guerra son vistos en su sitio y reflexionados también como introducción a empezar a hablar de ética general y de antología que hacemos al inicio del tercer curso. Y por último, eh, las relaciones internacionales que tienen una parte puramente académica, pues hay un grupo de alumnos este verano ya en la Universidad de Miami o en Moscú o en otros sitios haciendo formación clínica. Cuida también particularmente eh, de contactar con líderes que nos puedan ayudar en este área. Entonces tenemos un, una actividad habitual con la Facultad de Bioética de, de Roma, del Ateneo Pontificio Regina Apostolorum, que creo que fue la facultad primera de ética en Europa, con un grado. Y, y no se está presente o ha estado durante esta mañana en la sala. Eh, Alberto García es el director de la Cátedra UNESCO de, de Bioética y Derechos Humanos de Roma, con la que también estamos colaborando en la construcción de un instituto de bioética propio de la facultad y en el que esperamos implicar, pues aparte del profesorado que ya está aquí también presente, pues a expertos que nos quieran acompañar en este camino. Esperamos también que esta ocasión y esta sesión, que ha sido muy fructífera para mí en ideas, en provocaciones y en contactos, pues nos permita también ampliar esta red de constante internacional con vuestros centros, donde seguro que encontramos pues, eh, objetivos comunes y necesidad de trabajo conjunto. Nada más, muchas gracias.